great to see many of uh, old friends, colleagues, collaborators, and, uh, and office mates here. So it is. I'm really excited uh, to be part of this uh, event here. Uh, so my main job is to introduce the two distinguished speakers in the, in the morning session. And uh, before I do that, I thought I would give a brief uh, 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 personal reflection of uh, the field of cold collisions, particularly applied to cold molecular collisions. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and I divide that into two time segments, 1996 to 2000, uh, and, and then 2000 to present, uh, for uh, obvious reasons. Uh, uh, I came here in, 2000, in, in 1996 as a postdoc uh, with Alex, not as an ITAM postdoc. And, uh, uh, and that also was around the time uh, when uh, interest in coal molecules uh, began. Uh, so, uh, so our initial work involved, uh, involved quantum uh, threshold effects in uh, uh, coal molecule collisions. And later on, uh, it expanded into other aspects of uh, ultra-cold molecules, ultra-cold chemistry, and all the other interesting aspects of uh, cold molecule research. So um, as you know, uh, this was sort of the epicenter of uh, cold atom theory in the, in the uh, mid-90s, and, uh, and, it, and it sort of continued uh, ever since. Um, the BC in 1995 and the uh, Nobel Prize for the, uh, the cooling and trapping methods uh, that led to BEC uh, sort of uh, paved the way for cold molecule uh, 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 research, and, uh, uh, and, and for the association was uh, was largely the method of choice for preparing coal molecules at that time. But nothing uh, much was known about collisions of coal molecules, uh, whether uh, the molecules that are produced in high vibrational levels uh, in photo association experiments, whether, whether they would be stable against uh, collisions. Uh, so there were a lot of interesting questions about, uh, uh, about stability, uh, relaxation, inelastic processes involving uh, cold and ultra-cold molecules. And, uh, uh, and, and most of the, uh, I guess at that time, uh, mostly it was, uh, uh, it was uh, atomic uh, 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 physicists involved in, uh, in uh, ultra-cold uh, collision studies. And, and I believe I was uh, probably one of the uh, only chemists around, uh, uh, about, among, at least among the postdocs. So anyway, I, I, I came in 96, and, uh, and my initial project with Alex uh, was to look at not cold collisions, but uh, hot atoms. Uh, and uh, Alex had an NSF uh, uh, grant, a, a long-running NSF grant, uh, on uh, aeronome issues uh, uh, related to uh, super thermal collisions of uh, atoms in the upper, uh, in, 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 in the thermosphere. So I had a, a really um, uh, uh, a good time uh, collaborating with Alex and Vasily on many aspects of uh, high energy, uh, high temperature collisions <laughs> of uh, nitrogen, oxygen atoms, and, and related nitric oxide formation. But, but one day, when I was in Alex's office, uh, uh, Alex asked me, um, do you know uh, about what, you know, what happens to inelastic uh, cross-sections uh, uh, at low velocities as the, as the energy goes to zero? And that was something I have not really thought about it at that point. And, and, and sort of, I said, well, it should be small, maybe zero because I have not looked at quantum threshold effects up to that point. And Alex said, well, I think uh, the, uh, the cross section, I mean, this is what I generally hear when I talk to chemists, that they think the cross section goes to zero, but I think it actually should turn up at some point. And, uh, and so then we decided uh, uh, to look at that process more closely. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so this is an example of vibrational relaxation of H2 in collisions with helium. And, uh, and you can see the cross-section goes to small values uh, as the collision energy is decreased. But as Alex correctly anticipated, uh, because he, he knew he was talking about quantum threshold behavior, and, uh, and, and so the uh, cross-section does uh, increase and follow the inverse velocity dependence uh, at very low uh, collision energies. And so that was the starting point of our investigation of uh, inelastic processes in cold molecule collisions. And, and, and I think Alex, uh, uh, Alex had that. Uh, uh, he knew exactly uh, how these, uh, these uh, uh, 
uh, cross section should look like, and uh, and and so uh, we took that opportunity to to put that in in the form of a complex scattering length, uh, uh, where the inelastic part of the scattering length is related to the uh, related to the uh, rate constant uh, in the zero temperature limit. So that uh, parameterization is uh, is uh, quite widely used since then, and uh, so there are a couple of papers that describe this. Uh, uh, this formulation and uh, and since the cross section diverges uh, inversely as a velocity, the rate constant goes to zero, and this is the vibration quenching rate constants for uh, EH2 uh, as a fi uh, function of the vibrational levels, and uh, and and this kind of uh, effect has been shown, uh, in, you know, in many other cases, uh, and also for uh, chemical reactions. The time also coincided with uh, the greater interest in uh, threshold effects around that time. And I have to say, uh, many of the ITAM workshop uh, had a uh, very, very uh, significant uh, effect on, on how you know, that particular topic be got evolved uh, over the time. So these two back-to-back -back workshop uh, done at ITAM, one uh, focusing on uh, threshold effects uh, uh, and, and uh, the one uh, a year later on trapping spectroscopy and cold collisions uh, was, uh, I would say, a, a, a significant landmark uh, on how uh, cold molecule uh, uh, physics uh, uh, evolved. So, and there's a nice uh, topical review article that, that was one of the outcomes of the threshold phenomena workshop. And uh, the second uh, workshop, uh, I, I very well remember, uh, organized by Beaufort and John Doyle, uh, where we had uh, uh, the talk by Harold Meyer. Uh, we never heard about uh, uh, Stark decelerator before, but that was the first uh, Time that was uh, described in a uh, in a context like this, and 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 we know that now it has become a, 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 a widely adopted tool to cool and uh, and, and, and trap uh, uh, molecules and including polar molecules. So uh, uh, moving on uh, now, starting uh, 2000 and onwards, uh, and obviously the Nobel Prize for the BEC work was uh, a. a, a and impetus uh, for continued work in uh, ultra cold molecules, uh, for the association, buffer gas cooling methods, dark deceleration, uh, and uh, subsequently feshback resonance method, all contributed to the to the diverse uh, uh, aspects of uh, cold molecule research. And uh, and there was obviously talk about chemistry because uh, I think it, it's kind of interesting to ask. Uh, uh, do chemical reactions occur uh, at these low temperatures? And again, uh, Alex and I, you know, we had uh, some uh, talk about this, and uh, so we decided to uh, look at some benchmark uh, processes that have been studied at higher temperatures. So our, uh, so this is back in 2001. Uh, we uh, uh, looked at F plus fluorine plus H2 reaction and uh, uh, showed that the rate constant in the Zero temperature limit is uh, is sort of measurable for a barrier reaction, which is uh, sort of comparable to the room temperature value, and uh, and and uh, and of course there was no experimental result at that time, and uh, and and uh, since then uh, many of uh, you know of you in, in this audience know that ultra cold chemistry has uh, become a uh, a significant component of cold molecule research, and there is great deal of interest in. Uh, in looking at chemical reactions at uh, low temperatures and trying to see if it can be controlled at the ultimate quantum level. And uh, some experiments have already been done uh, uh, along those lines, uh, in particular the, the experiment on KRB at Gila and, uh, and, and, uh, and other recent works. So obviously I don't have time to talk about that, uh, but just want to emphasize another workshop that was done at ITAMP uh, in, uh, in 2004 on polar molecule. And again, there is great deal of interest in polar molecules. Uh, so you can see from time to time, the, you know, when there, were, there is a, a greater interest on some, uh, some uh, uh, specific topic, uh, there is an item workshop. And after subsequent to that, there is a lot more being done uh, on that particular uh, field. Again, there, there is a review, editorial review article as an outcome of this workshop that has been cited several hundred times. Uh, so it is. Uh, uh, so the impact goes just beyond the, uh, uh, the workshop itself. Uh, that time, it was a very cold, uh, uh, cold week here in Cambridge. Uh, you can see people all bundled up, uh, and so uh, almost polar conditions. Uh, 
And uh, so I, I want to make my remarks very brief. So uh, I just want to take this opportunity to once again thank Alex for all his support and vision and also for the opportunity to collaborate with many of you in this audience and uh, many who couldn't actually make it uh, to this meeting. So it has been a, a great opportunity to come here uh, and, uh, and be part of uh, these, uh, uh, these activities. So now the more important stuff.